Alright, g'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. In the midst of some big tumultuous, that's right, tumultuous, football trade news with the news that Lockie Neal is potentially joining the Fremantle Dockers. Yeah, baby! We did do a video on your channel, which is already out, uh, so go check that out. But uh, it sort of it got me thinking, Druzy, what occasions has a, has a club lost its best player? Mm -hmm. How many times has that happened? And what happened to that club? After that happened. So we found eight occasions a club has lost its best player or we're playing it a little bit fast and loose with ranking who the actual best player on their list was. It's hard to really, you know, get that accurate. But the players that we're going to mention were absolute all-star players and we're going to take a look at what happened when they left their club. Fast and loose, title of your sex tape. I like my women like I like my analysis. Fast and loose. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Drews, we're going to start off with uh, one very close to my heart. The West Coast Eagles lost both Chris Judd and Ben Cousins in the same single offseason. So this is a rare example where not just your best player leaves, but your best two player leaves. So at the end of 2007, Chris Judd requested a trade away from the West Coast Eagles, despite being the captain, uh, while our other, you know, potential GOAT player for us, uh, Ben Cousins, uh, tore his hammy off the bone in his final game for the club, and then, of course, gets sacked. Uh, you know, for all his off-field indiscretions. This was a period of massive off-field turmoil for the Eagles, having won the flag 12 months prior, but then they crashed out in at straight sets at the end of 07, only to lose their best two players. Ha! On top of that, throughout 2008, Daniel Kerr, our next best player, uh, missed most of that year due to injury, so mm. he dropped from uh, being, you know, in the top three, I think, in 07, to bottom two the following year. Judd, along with pick 56, which became Dennis Armfield, was sent to Carlton, while the Eagles received Josh Kennedy, Picks 3 and 20, which became Chris Maston and Tony Knott. On the Carlton side of things, they would play finals for a number of years, but never finish higher than 5th before mm. eventually embarking on their own rebuild. The Eagles, on the other hand, plunged to the bottom of the ladder for a number of years. They ended up drafting Nat Nui and Shui at the end of that season, and you could say losing those players at that time, becoming that shithouse, uh, allowed us to build for the next 2018 Premiership. Would you say that you won the trade? Given that you got Josh Kennedy, who's like your all-time top scorer. Probably, yeah. We probably did win the trade, yeah. The judge did win a Brownlow at Carlton, mm. uh, but I think it was a very mutually beneficial trade. Gary Ablett left Geelong at the peak of his powers in 2010, the year after they won the grand final against St Kilda, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. And of course, he went to Gold Coast to embark on a, a new club in the AFL, not only a new club for himself, but a new club in the AFL. I just said that twice. Analysis. It was pretty big news given that his dad, the GOAT, uh, played at Geelong and he was a father's son there, but him and his brother Nathan went up to Gold Coast and uh, yeah, played in a very stinky side that never made the top eight. The Cats went 17-5 in 2010 and 19 and 3 the next year when Chris Scott joined and they won the flag in 2011. So he missed out on a fair amount, Gary Ablett, and he would have brought probably another premiership to that side given how good he bloody is. He's the best player of our generation. It was a strange circumstance where Geelong lose pretty much the goat of the modern era mm. uh, and then improve and win the flag. Gary Ablett didn't uh, just smell away like Gold Coast did. He actually won a brown low for the Gold Coast Suns. So uh, his... His career individually continued to, to be great, but uh, not Gold Coast. Just goes to show how strong that Geelong side was. Very strong. The third player we're going to discuss is Brendan Favola, originally of the Carlton Footy Club, and then ended his career as a Brisbane Lion. Unfortunately, Carlton pretty much sacked Favola mm. uh, after a series of off-field indiscretions, most notably the 2009 Brownlow medal. But unfortunately for them, he was actually coming off seasons of 99 goals and then 89 goals. So this was a player that was, you know, at the peak of his powers, Crazy. Uh, playing incredible football, and then they had to sack him and offload him to the Brisbane Lions. Just let him get drunk and embarrass himself. If he's going to get you 80 plus goals a season, just let him be. So Carlton facilitated a trade to the Brisbane Lions. They sent Favola and pick 28, which became Callum Bartlett, to Brisbane in exchange for Lockie Henderson and pick 12, which became Kane Lucas. Not uh, bad. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Henderson did play a chunk of football for Carlton and then moved on to the Geelong Cats, obviously. Mm. So uh, not a huge reward for Carlton out of that. Probably on could have drafted better. Yeah, that's very true. In terms of Favola, he played one season at the Lions, played 17 games for 48 goals, uh, which is a pretty good return, but unfortunately he then got sacked again. <laughs> and uh, that would be the only season he would play in the AFL again. I have a true story about Brendan Favola, and I don't know if this will make the video, but on a mad Monday at Brisbane, he in his own <laughs> That's not a lie. Bro, I've seen <laughs> do that. <laughs> 
on the Carlton side of things, they actually dropped from 7th to 8th, and it wasn't a massive, you know, short-term loss, but the, unfortunately for them, in a side that never really pushed for premiership contention in the years that ensued, they really did need a key forward. So, it's a hard one where they probably did the right thing, because Favola probably would have messed up again somewhere down the track, <laughs> but if he just kept them on the straight and narrow, uh, he would have been a big player in that flop, uh, flag push for the Blues. Yes. Now, if this one isn't a merry-go-around, I don't know what is, Jesse. We're talking about Lockie Neal, who left Fremantle in 2018 at the end of the Ross Line era. He won our best and fairest, so clear to say he was our best player in that season. Uh, yeah, it was just a pretty average time to be a Frio fan and a Frio player. Lockie Neal couldn't see a future at Frio, so he went to a young, promising side in the Brisbane Lions, who he only won one final out of six with... <laughs> 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 we exchanged for picks which got us Hogan, Lobb and Samson. There was lots of trades basically, it wasn't mm. just a, a straight swap, it was pretty complicated. So the Lions went from the bottom four to the top two and Lockie Neal won a Brownlow medal. So he's probably spent his best years at the Lions and now he's potentially leaving. So this is like a double, double-headed double bloody, I don't know, sword or something. Dragon? Like, like a Darth Maul lightsaber. And yeah, when Lockie Neal left, we were already pretty bad so... Losing him, it wasn't like he was going to... If he was in our side, we would have made the top eight anyway. We'd probably still just stink outside of the, the top eight. We got Hogan and Lobb. Hogan stunk it up for us, just like that rat over there. And uh, Lobb has been good at times, but uh, quite inconsistent as well. It would be good to have him back. Please come home. The next player we're going to talk about is Wayne Carey, originally of the North Melbourne Footy Club, who ended his career at the Adelaide Crows. And This one's maybe a little questionable, because Wayne Carey probably wasn't their best player at the end of his career, but he's definitely one of the potentially the GOAT yeah. uh, of the modern era, so I thought it was worth including him. Another player on this list who was embroiled in off-field drama, of course, he uh, had an extramarital affair yes. with his teammate and uh, then-best friend, apparently, Anthony Stevens' wife, and subsequently took a year off footy before uh, being signed by the Adelaide Crows. Obviously, couldn't step foot back at the North Melbourne Footy Club. Despite losing Wayne Carey, arguably their greatest pe player ever, the Roos did improve from 13th on the ladder to 7th without him in 2002, and were largely unaffected Effect, and that's probably due to the fact that he was probably past his prime and they had sort of had that transition sort of ready to go. Blow up. Yes. <laughs> he would have a couple of decent years at the Adelaide Crows, but probably the most interesting part of that period was when Adelaide then played North Melbourne in 2003 and he got into a few fisticuffs with Glenn Archer and Anthony Stevens. So I think he kicked four goals that night, including uh, one of the goals of the year as well. So yeah. it was not without drama. Danger. Field. Nice. Dangerfield left the Adelaide Crows when you could just say he was about to come one of the best players in the comp in 2015. It's one of those players that was sort of always rumoured to uh, want to return home to Geelong, and he did. So being a restricted uh, free agent, Adelaide forced to trade with Geelong, uh, but this was before you could trade future picks, so they were a little hamstrung in terms of, you know, offering multiple firsts. They pretty much offered uh, pick nine, uh, Dean Gore, and pick 28, and those players became Wayne Miller, and uh, I think they traded it for Daniel Menzel as well. Okay. So on the whole, it's hard to say that Adelaide got a very good deal there. Yes. But, having said that, Dangerfield went to Geelong chasing premierships, and Geelong are one of those sides that could be one of the best sides ever and not win a premiership, although they're still in the finals hunt this year. Time is ticking for the Cats and that Patrick Dangerfield era, which they have gone balls to the wall for inexperienced talent. Dangerfield took the Cats from 10th to 2nd in that one season that they, they finished outside, and then Dangerfield comes in, bang, into 2nd. Obviously, he won a brown low, and he narrowly missed out to... Uh, sorry, uh, Dusty, Dusty. Dusty, yes. So he won and runner-up on another one as well. So obviously he's come into his prime at Geelong. So I'd say Geelong won this trade, clearly, but no premiership still. The Crows, though, they didn't miss him too much, Jesse. They went from 6th to 5th and then obviously made the grand final in 2017. So he was an important part of that side, but glow up again. They, are, they, they didn't miss him. Adelaide were terrific in that period in that they kept losing key players, but their ability to replenish and still be a good side was really imp uh, impressive. But mm -hmm. you have to think it's a bit of a what-if moment. What if Dangerfield had stayed? Yeah. Would they have won the flag in 2017? You could make that argument. Yes. The next player we're going to talk about is Dane Beams of the Collingwood Football Club at this particular time, who requested a trade to the Brisbane Lions. And you could sort of argue and quibble, was Dane, was Dane Beams their best player at the time? Well, maybe not, but he was certainly in that conversation. He had a few off-field issues. I think his father was ill uh, back in Queensland, so he requested a trade back there. So the deal was Beams was sent with pick 27 to the Brisbane Lions, and in exchange for that, Collingwood received Jack Crisp, pick 5, which became Jordan Dugowie, 
and 25, which I think was then traded for Levi Greenwood. So Collingwood did very, very well out of that deal. Very good. Very, very wheel. Now, he would perform pretty well at the Lions. I think he won a joint best and fairest in one of his first seasons there, but it would be a period of limited success, which was a very difficult time for Brisbane Lions in terms of the timeline of their history. Mm -hmm. By contrast, on the back of that trade, while Collingwood kind of struggled for a little bit there, they shot into a surprise grand final in 2018. And you'd have to say Jack Crisp and Jordan Dugowie and Levi Greenwood, in fact, were all pretty big parts of that team. And in particular, Crisp and Dugowie right now are extremely key players to them. In hindsight, Dane Beams requesting a trade away from Collingwood ended up to be a bit of a... Uh, blessing in disguise. I think that was what I was going to say. A blessing in disguise because they managed to turn that into a two or three key players in a grand final push and they're still going to be important players going forward. Can you say that? It's a blessing in disguise. <sighs> the last one. In 2020, at the end of the 2020 season, Jeremy Cameron requested a trade away from from GWS and Jeremy Cameron was there since day one started from the bottom took him to the grand final kicked the first goal in that 2017 grand final if I remember correctly yes, you do. he was a common medalist at GWS and yeah obviously one of the best forwards in the comp and it took the wind out of their sails out of all of the players that have left GWS over the years all the top talent I think Jeremy Cameron was the biggest one he was the spearhead off that forward line and it sort of made them have to redesign their whole mid to forward connection because he was just such a talisman GWS got Pick 13, 15, and 20. So three first rounders. They're, this is a big uh, blow to Geelong's future if they don't get a flag again, like that bloody Dangerfield trade. P probably not as important, but those picks become Stone and Angwin. And I think the third one of that was on traded as part of a deal to get picked two this year. So Ooh. they more or less turned you know Jeremy Cameron into a series of high picks. Jeremy Cameron left in 2020, and it was the year where they had that sort of premiership loss hangover that we see lots of sides have. So Jeremy Cameron was probably thinking, I'm in the prime of my career. I'm going to go join an established side, which I know could probably bring me success. GWS, they made the top eight this season, and uh, they're looking good for next year as well. Their future's looking bright. Let's stay chilled on this one and see who has won the trade. It's all going to depend on that Geelong Premiership. It really does. If the Cats win the flag on the back of uh, Jeremy Cameron this year, then they're well and truly justified. And GWS probably couldn't... Oh, uh, Ben Cousins is here! It's too hard to say whether GWS improved without him. I guess they did on face value, but I'm sure they would rather have him on the list right now. For sure. To be honest. All right, that's it, guys. That is eight clubs who lost their best player. Let us know in the comments uh, if you think there's anyone we missed and what you generally thought of the video. Make sure you stay tuned on the True Footy YouTube channel for finals content coming up. And we're going to be doing a live stream on Saturday night for Port Adelaide and the Western Bulldogs. And we'll be in attendance for the Friday night prelim in Perth. So stay tuned to Drewsy's channel for the resultant vlog. That'll be on Saturday. Really appreciate all the support lately, guys. We're ticking over closer to that 15k mark by Grand Final Day. So if you haven't already, I'd appreciate you subscribing to my channel. And then go to Drewsy's channel and then hit subscribe. Then watch all of our videos and hit like. Thank you. Thanks for watching, guys. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.